Hello guys, how you doing? Welcome to another episode of Hot Knife's House. Thank you for joining me and I tell you, if you hear a wee bit of noise in the background, a wee bit of fan noise, that's because I'm surrounded by fans at the moment in a kind of cyclone type arrangement. Because here in Glasgow, um, we're having a heat wave. There's something in the sky, kind of like a UFO that kind of hovers above us and that's called the sun. Because uh, we don't ever actually see it here in Glasgow. And when we do, everyone has a meltdown. Everyone freaks out. No one's prepared for it. And that includes me pretty much. Because there's only a couple of days of the year where it's like this. So I'm literally sitting here surrounded by fans at the moment. But thank you for tuning in. Remember, we are on the chat as well. If you are online, then just add it. I'm just going to go into my wee chat room here. Say hello to me. I'll kick the ball off. Hello guys, here we go. So, we are working on a track of mine tonight, a track called Breakfast. The Breakfast is a song that me and Mr. T penned, and what I'm going to do, and just to let some other guys join us on the chat, I'm going to let you hear the track that we're working on first. And by the way, because of this meltdown we're having in Glasgow, where we're having a total heat wave, I've also got a dreadful case of hay fever, which um, you may hear me throughout, and you may see my eyes are a bit red at the moment as well, but enough about me, we are talking about music production, so you're going to get your questions in, and like I say, during that time, I'm going to let you hear a wee bit of the night's track, and this is a brand spanking new track, this, I would say, is, this is a premiere, this is the first time ever I've been playing this online, this is a song that's been signed to play records, like I say, myself and the vocalist Mr T that I work with, this is a track, very housey, a good fun, good party track of ours called breakfast so there we go a nice picture of a an english breakfast there for you this is a track we are going to be doing let's have a
So there you have it. Oh. So nice, I gotta pay it twice. Remember to switch your loot off, guys. Do the live streaming tip there. Anyway, yeah, so that is the track that we are working on at the moment. If I jump over to the screen, here we go. We have the track in front of us. Now, there is actually the radio edit and the full 12-inch mix. I'll get a 12-inch mix on later on. Now, the radio edit's more or less the one we'll concentrate on first. Now, what I would say, I mean, obviously, I talk you through how I put the track together every week, and I'm giving you hints on, you know, different sounds and whatnot. But I think this week, just talking about the actual writing of the song itself, because this is something that's, you know, everything else hinges on it. I would say songs are the lifeblood of the music industry. You know, that is where... Everything starts from songs will live on forever, you know, videos might not, I don't know what happens with YouTube in the future, but I think people can uh, have that kind of special relationship with a song and everything, and that's really, if you can touch people, if you like, with your music, to sound all kind of, um, yeah, arty farty about it, then yeah, that's the number one thing. Now, all songs that I write, I would say, come from some kind of uh, inspiration, there needs to be some kind of, you know, hook to it. And in this case, this is a song I write with my, my writing partner, Mr. T. If you're watching Mr. T, hello. You need to join us and do one of these with us someday, mate. But anyway, so yeah, he's got a book that he kind of always writes his notes in and stuff. And uh, I was looking through it and he said, but he kind of laughed as he was looking through it. And he said, oh, I said, what's that? He said, oh, it's this line in a song. It's, uh, I just wrote, uh, me, me and your girl have meals, mostly breakfast. And I thought it was quite funny, but a cheeky line. And it was in my head, and we started to think about it, and I kind of had this idea for kind of house track, very housey influenced, and I thought that'd be a real good vocal, maybe a kind of almost, you know, narrated type vocal with, a, you know, that kind of demon voice effect. I heard that's very popular in a lot of good dance songs. There's an old house song called uh, Sinner, uh, or Sin, no, S-I-N hyphen N-U-H. Uh, by Motherload, and that's got a big deep voice that kind of runs through it. Why are you here at the club so provocatively dressed? Because you're a sinner. And it's a real kind of, I mean, it's not. it's been done in many house tracks, you know, so we're not reinventing the wheel per se, but I just got a good feel about it. It's a good fun party track, you know, and uh, with a good bouncy kind of house bass line to it as well. So, yeah, songwriting, like I say, start off with a hook. You need to get something that moves you, something that kind of grabs you, and then from there you can flesh out a bit, add on other sections, you know, whether it be bridges or verses. But I think starting with the, the main hook, the chorus, is the way I'd normally do it. It needs to be something that grabs me, something that's of interest. So, now on my, uh, I'll just show you here, on my screen, yes, very top, I always have the mastered track. That's more or less just for comparison purposes when I'm showing you guys how I've done this. Because as I always say, this is Logic 10 and I actually use Logic 9 to produce. Part of the reason as well, it works for me. I've ran with it. I've switched sequencer four times in the one year many moons ago. And that just caused all sorts of problems with creativity. So find something that works for you and run with it. And I certainly have with Logic and all my music, as you can always see, is colour-coded. We have all the drums in pink at the top there. We have the bass, which is in purple. And we have some kind of synthy elements in green here. And some string elements in blue. You can see I've grouped everything together to make it easy to read. Like I say, late night sessions, you want to locate these things straightforward. Now, how many channels are we rocking here? I don't even know if it gives me a channel count. Let me find. Oh, well, yeah, it does. Including some of the effects channels. We're up to about 70 channels there. And more if you include the group. So that's why I always colour code things. You get that amount of channels, you're going to get completely lost in it. So it's worthwhile taking a wee bit of time out during a session to do what you call your housekeeping. Okay, you want to make sure that these files are easily readable to yourself. And when you go to remix it, you go to revisit it, if it's a year down the line, you've not looked at the files in ages, all of a sudden, you don't even know what half of the tracks are because you can't tell. Some of the times you get really ridiculous names you've left on in a session. And uh, yeah, eventually, you're like, what is that? But if it's all color coded, right, I know that's one of the drums or I know that's one of the bass, etc. So what have we got here, right? Intro loop. This is the sample, boy. This is the sample that starts off a record.
Yeah, that's a kind of disco -y type sample. Now, this was a, a copyright free sample that I got, so that always makes these things a wee bit easier to use. You can get a lot of classic records and sample them and whatnot, but you're going to run into a bit of problems if you end up releasing it. In the, in the case of this, I have released this, or this track is to be released. And I think I'm okay to say, if you're watching Play Records, that we are doing an album. Yes, indeed. And this is going to be one of the tracks on it. And this is probably one of my favourite tracks I've done in recent times. So this is getting released, like I say, that intro loop, I do classic kind of feel about it. Here we go again. Yeah, almost seems to kind of filter out as well, and then that filters back in. Yeah, so that there, like I say, just a sample that I've used, sample that is a copyright free sample, thankfully. And I've backed that up with a wee bit of tambourine as well. Tambourine, the unsung hero of the recording world, tambourine, you'll find in absolutely everything, especially at choruses and songs, it just really loosens up the high end, and I generally play in my tambourines, I like to use a lot of organic elements, um, thankfully I run a recording studio which is here at the HQ Glasgow, although it looks like I'm sitting in my mum's house, all the equipment is over the other side here, like I say, yeah, I mean, I'm going to invest in one of them you can have fancy webcam shortly, I think that'll be the next step and I can show you around my studio a bit more. At the moment I'm stuck because my iMac that I'm looking at at the moment is sitting in this end of the studio. But anyway, enough, I digress. So yeah, the tambourine, always good to put in the high end of stuff. Just really loosens up that high end, makes it, gives it a groove. And everything I do really as Hot Knife is about having a groove, you know? If you get something that's a, I mean, I, I don't mind really electronic music, but I don't know if I could necessarily just just produce something that didn't have any kind of feel to it. I'm a musician at the core of my being. Uh, I really got into music production probably. I mean, I got into music production was about 13, 14, because I started off with a four track, and then it was just recording myself playing drums, playing bass, playing guitar, and I could effectively create this band without having to have a band. And... This is just really an extension of that. And I've been reading books and really researching the, the whole art of production, if you like, since then, since I've been about 14. You know, so all this kind of stuff really is what I've learned over the years and everything that I'm showing you at the moment. But anyway, yeah, talking about the drums here, all important. The kick drum, now that is quite a serious bass drum. That is when the song kicks in as well. Before that, we've got a couple of loops, snare and kick loop, what's this? Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that's a sample I've used from somewhere as well. I mean, I have been in the past, I've, I've made up all my own hits and I know exactly how to do it. I've worked on drum machines and uh, really kind of created everything from the ground up. But as to whether you've created it from the ground up or whether you've actually um, downloaded it, does the dance floor care? I would say they couldn't care less. So it's like buying prefabricated parts of a, a house and putting it together, no one's going to stop and go, wait a wee minute here, he took those prefabricated bits from elsewhere, no, 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 it's all about how the track comes out at the end of the day, so these, like I say, are loops that I've used, we've got a particular kind of boom back kind of feel to them as well, and amongst that I've some hats, that's another loop, loops are very good to give you a swing, in the same way I would use a live tambourine etc, often a loop has a kind of certain feel to it, if someone's made up these loops in the first place, maybe using technology I don't have, things like an Akai sampler, for instance. Akai samplers have got great swing functions on them, and the kind of way they, you know, compress the sound, and the way they deliver the sound as well, um, has a kind of unique quality to it. And by putting something through, you know, say like an Akai sampler, different sounds, and then, you know, using their swing functions, you maybe get a sound you wouldn't get elsewhere. So that's what this sample gives me. I don't necessarily go and have have to create this sound on a specific set of, you know, uh, samplers, etc. to make, you know, to, to create that kind of swing. It's already there for me. So I, I prefer to just, you know, use loops in that case. And it doesn't make me a bad person either. I've decided after much soul searching, I add. Anyway, right, on the chat here, Big Man Tutu. Hello. Hello, Big Man Tutu. And what is it that makes you so big? Tell me. Keep it clean. Yep, and by the way, anyone else wants to add on the chat here, please get involved, let me know what's going on, what do you want to hear about, if there's anything that I'm talking about 
and you don't understand, you want me to explain further, then please do. That's why we are live on Twitch TV. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks for tuning in. And if you have just tuned in, this is Hot Knife's House, where we are deconstructing one of my tracks, a house track called Breakfast. And, uh, yeah, hopefully we're giving you some tips you can use in your own productions as well. So there we go. What else do we have in this track? So this is the initial stages of the song. We have the, like I say, we have this bass and snare loop. I've got a kind of swingy hat loop. I've got a bongo loop as well. Yeah, real classic disco feel. Everything I'm about, really, um, disco is my favourite and it'll always filter into the music that I make because it's just really what my grounding is in dance music. And all dance music really does go back to disco, all that four on the floor stuff. I don't think it gets quite the credit it deserves. But that look there, very disco. Got the swingy hats. Got the boom back. Okay, there's no real bass drum in that either. Nothing's kicked in. When the song kicks in, you'll notice here, I've got a kick drum ready to go. Boom. And then here we go. Yeah, that gets the party started there. So it's almost like a, a, a kind of pre-kick-in kick in that we use. That kind of sound is often used by... Uh, <laughs> So I'm looking over at my chat here, I'm getting distracted. Big man Tutu, can't keep it clean, mate. <sighs> Neither can I, man, but I'm broadcasting, so I'm trying to be all proper. Anyway, yeah, that bass drum, like I say. When we take that out of the sound, we have that kind of, that pre-kick-in section. Before the song really gets happening. And here the bass drum comes in. Yep. Then we go all four on the floor at that bit. So that bass drum that I'm adding in there, quite a kind of top heavy sound. It's what I call a Euro bass drum sound. It's got a new click to it, as well as got a note at the bottom of it. Now that's very important. When you're selecting a bass drum for a track, if you're not particularly musically minded, just be careful you're not using a bass drum that's out of tune. Okay, I started producing music and I was using an old set of Jamo speakers. Okay, Jams, Jamo speakers were like a, just the kind of the hi-fi speakers you had to have at the time. Hi-fi speakers for producing music, an absolute no-no. Problem is when you're using something that's not proper studio monitors, they're massaging the sound, they're making things sound nice, they're not revealing the sound. I use a set of Yamaha HS80s, which are kind of like the... The classic NS10 speaker, white cone, black surround, but a bit bigger, a bit more bass. Because bass is very important when you're doing dance music. I also have in my studio, I've got two 89 subs with a 3 kilowatt amp driving them downstairs, which makes for a fantastic stereo. And that's probably most of what it gets used for and winding up the other offices that are in my block here. But yeah, so like I say, paying attention to the bass, that bass note... You need to make sure that you're getting the right note. And all it takes is to really listen to that along with, say, an element like a, a bass, for instance, something that's the root note of the track. Now, I've taught music theory in the past. I'm a guitar teacher. I think I've done most jobs in the music industry. But, yeah, I've been a guitar teacher and I, and I taught music theory as well. And that's something that I find helps. It doesn't... It's not too big a problem, I don't think, for dance music knowing music theory. Music theory just puts a name on things that you already know. If you hear something that's out of tune that sounds terrible, it's probably because it's not in the same key or it doesn't have that kind of relationship that you would otherwise get from something that was in key. So if I play that bass drum along with, say, the bass line of the track, let's see what we got here. Okay, so the key. Mm, uh, that's the root note there, okay. You can hear there is a bit of tone on that bass drum. Like I say, just make sure it is the correct tone that you have in that bass drum. The real Melly Fresh, I'm over the chat here. Woo, I like that. Hello, Melly, how you doing? Yo, and by the way, I see lots of you have added yourself into the, the chat here also. A lot more people viewing, so see yo. Great stuff, Melly. Right, anyway, yeah, back to the matter at hand. We are talking about the... Reverse engineering, the reconstruction, if you like, of one of my songs with a vocalist called Mr. T. I'm 
my writing partner, a song called Breakfast. So, yep, yeah, all drums here. When we get to that kick-in section where the bass drum is, we've still got all these other loops we were using earlier on, so we've just added in a bass drum. You can see this here, we've just kicked the party off there. And what other loops? We've added in a couple of loops here. Now, this follows the classic house format, this song. Every eight bars or so, you're adding in another element. Look at a song like, um, say, the Daft Punk's Around the World. Classic example. Every eight bars, you get something, a new element coming into the track. And that, for me, is something that works really well on a dance floor. Something that works all throughout house music. Oh, big man Tutu on the chat. Yo. Good stuff. Yo. Anyway, so... What else do we have here? Another loop that we added in. Now I like this kind of loop. I think you might refer to this as a Jack in House loop. Genres for me are a wee bit, um, a wee bit indistinct. I'm never quite sure what genre I'm in. Am I in house? I'm in techno. I know this track in particular is very housey, but don't get too worried about what genre you're doing. Really, just make music that really you, you enjoy. Obviously, you need to think about where you're going to market it, who you're going to send it to, and whether they deal with your kind of music. But in the case of genres, a lot of people that are very analytical about music are not the ones that are necessarily creating it. I think creative people just get on with it, put it out there, and let other people analyse it. So, this boom back kind of... Oh, sorry, that kind of jack and house loop that I've got. If I play the other loops without it, then drop it in, you'll see the difference it makes. Okay, so we get... If I had this loop here, here we go... Yeah. And I've also got an offbeat snare. Yeah. 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 So adding all those rhythms together, it's quite rhythmically dense now. We're giving it a real kind of swing. And that's what a lot of these loops do. One thing to watch though, when you are putting in loops, make sure the swing is all swinging in the same place. Because if it's not and one loop's a bit swingy, and one loop's a bit straight. What I mean by swing, that's a kind of swing rhythm, but a straight rhythm would just be a lot straighter. One and two, you know, if you be careful with that, because if you mix a swingy rhythm with a very straight sounding rhythm, the whole thing can start to get a wee bit, a wee bit confused sounding, okay? You either have it swinging, or you don't have it swinging. It's the same with DJing. If you're mixing two records together, and in particular in the hi-hat parts, if one's got a very straight hi-hat rhythm, and another one's got a swingy hi-hat rhythm, it can be difficult to actually beat match the two records. All the bass drums are in the same place. It's the actual swing within the beats, you know. So like I say, everything there's swinging together. Yeah. The breakdowns here, I've got some snares building, this kind of... Yeah. Now, I programmed that in. Programmed that in myself. No, it doesn't really matter, though, whether you program it in and you write the dots in a MIDI or you download the sample, whatever it is that works. But I specifically wanted a rhythm on the beat there, if I go into this file here for that snare build, you'll notice that every first beat is missing. Okay? It's it. And two and, and three and, and four and, and one and, 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 and. Probably won't get that through the mic, but yeah. Every first beat there is missing. Have a listen. We've got on the metronome. So the metronome's on the beat. Yeah, I just find that it leaves a bit of space for any bass drum or anything that's on beat one. If you put the actual, instead of just going one nah, 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 and doing a straight fill, you're taking out beat one in each case. It, it just gives it a wee bit more of a swing and it leaves a bit of room for anything that is on the beat as well. Almost in the way a side chain compressor would work. Okay, so I think that's all the drums. If you're just tuned in, thank you very much for joining us. We are here in HQ Glasgow on a very warm day, which is why I'm surrounded by fans. Part of the reason I've not done my mohawk as well. But I can always do one of those, you know, music videos like Steve Vai, you know, into the fan, play my guitar, windswept, but I won't. I'll get back to the matter at hand. Yeah.
Like I say, this song we are talking about is Breakfast. So, on to the bases now. Yep, all my bases here are in blue. So we start off with this bass line here. Yep. You notice you're getting a wee bit of delay on that bass. That was an actual bass patch initially. It's quite a straightforward sound, not much to that. Um, it's a kind of stepping up riff, a kind of almost like a classic funk riff. I like ascending riffs, okay? And this riff happens over an eight bar period, which is a good, I would say it's a good length for a bass riff to repeat in itself, but there's no rights and wrongs in music. Whatever sounds good is good, really. But this track here, let like I say, we're working in eight bar sections in a kind of classic house format. So that, there we go. One, two, three, four, two, three, four, one, two. So similar, starts, starts kind of similar again. And then we get a different riff. And then that whole phrase repeats again. It's a real classic kind of housey kind of format that as well, but in amongst that we've got this bass line coming in which is a kind of... That's making use of semitones, okay? Yep. Something about that semitone thing, I use it quite a lot. Think Jaws, all that kind of... Semitones, if I'm to get talking about music theory to you, semitones are quite attracted to each other. They're notes that seem to lead to each other very easily. Um, you know, a kind of lot of rock and roll riff. That kind of idea. They use a lot of that semitone thing. I see a lot of dance tracks using it as well. And in this case, it just creates a bit of a kind of ominous vibe for this one. So we've got that kind of sneaking in through the track, if I play the track at the same time. So it starts off the original bass line, and that bass line that comes in there eventually takes over. So we get... Me and your girl, we watch Netflix. Me and your girl, we play Tetris. She's in my world, you can't check this. Me and then we've got this bass line that comes in here. And then that bass line eventually becomes the main bass line. Okay. So at that point in the track, this bass line here. Starts off just initially as a kind of top end kind of sound. Yeah, not a great deal of bass in that if I just put on a spectrum analyzer. Yeah, not much. I've cut a bit of bass out of that initially. Reason being is that the bass that I use underneath the track. So that's one of the lower basses I bring underneath that riff. And this of kind of square wave sound, a very basic sound that if I put that together with Black Fuzz, which is the name of the patch, and the top end. Yeah. So as I'm always telling you, layering up sounds is everything in dance music, and that's what I've done there. I've got one working the low frequency, or, yeah. That's, I mean, it's not really in the sub range, but it's still quite a subby kind of sound. It's quite, quite dull. And there's reason for that. This is giving a bit more a kind of punchy, kind of squelchy type sound, which is actually down the octave from the other bass line. So they're covering the bass, and up the top, I've got this riff here. Yeah. It's quite a stereo sound, that as well. I like to have in a bass line something in the sub. Something, you know, in the middle and that kind of sound at the top. And the top sound I always have slightly in stereo. So it's a, it's a bass sound that covers a whole range. 
and often I do that with you know bass drum sounds as well. If you think about dance music in its purest form, you're often just getting you know a, a, a bass drum, snare drum, with a hi hat and a, you know, a synth and a kind of high end riff. Some tracks are built on that and they all sound great, but when you look closer at them, you'll see how much layering has actually went into a lot of those sounds. So layering sounds is everything. Even if it seems to be just a small, insignificant part of the sound, all these things gather together to create a real a real complete sound that covers all the frequencies. As I've said before, yeah, people might be listening to this on a massive sound system. They might be cranking this in six by nines, but unfortunately, probably most people will be listening to it on one of these Okay, not even plugging in their headphones either. They'll be just listening. I mean, all this time you spend in your music and people are just listening to it on their iPhone. But it's still very important. And often I listen to it on my phone. Someone sends me a track. What do you think of that? Okay, I'll put it on. You know, so it needs to sound good on an iPhone. And an iPhone's not going to produce any bass. So all your, mu your bass sounds would get lost otherwise. So that's why having those kind of top-end sounds and having that bass sound covering the full frequency spectrum really works that'll give you a kind of that'll give you the baseline on an iphone okay and then you go and put it in a club sound system something a bit bigger you know even a home hi-fi and you'll get the rest of the bass sound in there so like i say layering sounds is all the rage with mr hot knife anyway so this is another sound that i've worked on i've had this love that Yeah, that's playing, at, I believe, at a minor seventh. Yeah, that effect there, a real classic kind of rave sound, that. It just adds another element on top of this. Yeah. So you want quite an ominous flavour to that track. You want it to kind of uh, disturb you slightly, and that, that minor seventh really does well. A good job of doing that. Now, another sample as well, and this is one I made up. At the end of each of these bass lines, you will hear. Just get it now, here we go. Yeah. It just kind of completes to every eight bars that phrase. There we go again. And one of my favourites. You can liken that to one of your uh, old Seiko sports watch alarms. <laughs> Sounds pretty high end, but at night it gives it a wee bit of a. Just gives it an, an, another bit of the spec. The, the frequency spectrum is covered. Then there's nothing on that range. It's like bass. I always make the joke when I play, in a, uh, and I do play in a couple of bands. Still play as a, an actual instrumentalist, and I always tell a bass player, just turn that up full, man, because I'm a bass junkie. Yeah, I'm a baseline junkie, as Dizzy Rascal said. But no, I, I love the bass. But the reason why you can turn up is because there's nothing else on that range. Unless you get a piano player, which we don't really have, but they're not playing the keyboard down that range, or, or, or just a keyboard player that's not playing into the bass keys, then that, pre that frequency band pretty much belongs to just the bass. And this frequency band here is the other end of the spectrum. There's nothing on that. So here we go. Over in the chat here, Knox556, man, I love this guy. Right back at you, mate. Hello again. And anyone else, please, please drop a wee message. Say hi to your Uncle G-Man. Anyway, here we go. Right, that sound there, that high-pitched bleep. It's going from left to right. You notice it's slightly going from left to right. And you should hear it going from left to right because... I've went, I've really went to town on this one and actually um, got a stereo feed for you because the last couple of times I think I broadcast I wasn't such luxury, stereo luxury, how about that? Stereophonic sound. And on that note, that kind of sound there. Where did I get influenced from that? Like a disco whistle. <laughs> there we go, I'm back on the chat here. Like a disco whistle, yes it is. Hail Stormer, hi Uncle G-Man. <laughs> that sounds really dodgy, doesn't it? I sound like I should be some kind of storyteller. 
Uncle G, man. Hello there, everyone. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for leaving some chat. Anyway, that sound, that was influenced by an old, an old. Uh, I don't even know if you call it a house track because house music was just emerging at the time, but bomb the bass, beat this, keep this frequency clear. It's this kind of, you know, really high-pitched bleep. It's the only time I really heard that in songs, but I've got a tendency of throwing it in. It's, uh, I wouldn't say it was a signature sound. There's no such thing as a signature sound. Everything has been borrowed along the way from somewhere. So like, thanks guys if you've just tuned in. Remember, we are working on a track at the moment called Breakfast Now. I'm going to give you a wee blast on this track just so you know what we're talking about now. This is also the premiere, the debut playing of this track. So, I'm going to give you the 12-inch mix. This is my favourite mix. 12-inch mix, when you're doing it, it's really... I think that you get much more opportunity to get the groove in there. There's a lot longer sections. You know, it's better in a club, a 12-inch mix. The radio mix is exactly that. It's designed for radio. It's designed for the kind of three-and-a-half-minute um, in-and-out, verse-bridge, chorus, verse-bridge, chorus, fade. That is your classic radio edit, but you can go to town a wee bit more, you can get some more interesting things in the 12-inch. I mean, this mix as well that I'm going to play you, the 12-inch mix, actually has a rap in it. T, as well as being a fantastic vocalist, is also an excellent rapper as well. In fact, I don't think there's many things he's not good in at, jammy so-and-so. But anyway, this track here I'm going to play you is the 12-inch mix of Hot Knife versus Mr. T Breakfast. So... I'm going to get my wee picture of the breakfast up here while I'm playing this. There we go. This is the 12-inch mix of the track that we are working on tonight. This is Hot Knife Vessel, Mr. T, Mega Breakfast Mix.
song about fried food. Favourite bit? Yeah. So, yeah, that is the track we are working on. Thank you if you have just joined us. This is Hot Knife's House live production session with Q&A. So get on that chat and ask away, guys. I'm here to answer your questions. Lots of new people tuning in there. Thank you, guys, for joining us. Anyway, so, yeah, we have been working through the track Breakfast. Now, like I say, everything's colour-coded here. Strings, yeah, strings you may have heard at the end of the track there. That's like a pizzicato string type effect. That's a very trance type sound that I've used in there. Yeah, a lot of songs like, uh, you know, uh, I suppose Encore and Foie, classic example. That kind of, dun, 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 that kind of, you know, very 90s type sound, I would say. But in there, it really heightens the mood. It really adds to the flavour. You know, that kind of sound. Here we go. Like... So it's following the bass riff. I've also got a high string. A real typical kind of, you know, old school thing. The high string going to go in throughout that. It just almost takes it up there. It's right up the very top. You know, this is us at the end of the track. And when you get to the end of the track... That's the loudest part of the song, I would say, for a dance record. That's when really everything's coming together, and then we kind of, you know, just... Yeah. Okay, so that just takes us there. That, that string's saying that we've reached our peak, if you like. One thing I've not talked about, but something I use a whole lot of in this track, and I don't actually have the plugin in front of me to talk about, but I do have... The actual picture itself. Here we go the Roland Space Echo. Now what I'm using is a recreation of this sound. Hang on a wee second here, we're on the chat, the real Melly Fresh. I'm coming to UK July 4th. Let's see if we can sync up diaries then. Nice one, cool. Okay then, so I, yeah, back to this, the Roland Space Echo. Now, the importance of this unit, I would say it can't be overlooked. This was used by all your dub reggae producers now. Dub Reggae, I think, you know, is one of the real unsung heroes of the music industry, or in particular the dance music industry, uh, because Dub Reggae is really the first, that was the first remixers, people like King Tubby, people like Lee Scratch Perry, people who I love, people I really idolise as producers that really kind of brought something new to the table. Dub Reggae was when they took the vocals out of track and more or less got the stems, the stems being the kind of some parts. In the olden days, you probably only had two or three tracks, maybe a four-track demo. So maybe you had like the vocals on one track, and you would have had all the, you know, bass and drums maybe together on a track. Other ones, guitars and keys, for instance. But there was only four tracks or so to use on tape back in the day. So when King Tubby was going to release a single on his record label, he didn't have a B-side one time. What he'd done was got the four tracks and remixed them on the spot, added a bit of echo in through the Rowan Space Echo, and uh, yeah, and so, some other kind of, you know, effects that still get used today, but that kind of delay trip sound, that kind of tape delay effect on this Rowan Space Echo really has permeated throughout dance music, and it's one of them sounds that I think you can't really get any elsewhere. I do use a, a plug-in right now, which gets very close to it, a plug-in called Outer Space, um, and that really... But a mate of mine who has a space echo and he said don't bother getting one Gregor I was very nearly getting one he said don't bother just buy this plug-in plug-in let's say called outer space it does a cracking job right down to the actual you know tape noise if you'd ever really want that in the recording for that real kind of you know authentic feel but just to give you an example of where I've used this because I have used this effect in quite a few parts of this song let me show you well, listen to the actual mastered file here Yeah, just at the, the build-ups, the big delay trips here, have a listen. Breakfast. Hear that going left Breakfast. and right. Back it up. 
I've got one of my favourite effects on that, a tremolo, which kind of slightly drifts the sound from left to right. I use that in a lot of things. It gives a real nice kind of, you know, wash, especially with the sound of that Rowan Space Echo. That kind of, is a, often what you're hearing is the sound of the feedback. Now, on the Space Echo itself, do I have that picture still up there? I don't know that. Rowan Space Echo. Here we go, yeah. On that sound there, you have this intensity button here. You can see where my mouse is. Now, that basically makes the thing feed back in itself. So without even having an instrument plugged into a Space Echo, you can turn up the intensity and what that will do is it'll start to create a feedback look, even for just the dirt the on the actual tape loop itself, because it's an act, there is a tape loop which creates that delay effect. So even just the dirt from that can actually create a kind of real kind of um, wash that, <laughs> that loud, sound that gets louder. What I then do, like I say, is pan that left to right. And that is one of the big effects that I use throughout this track. And if we go to another build up, let's check it on the 12 inch mix, then you'll hear it in there as well, I'm sure. Go, go. Trying to find a good example of it. Yeah. There we go. I love that sound, it's just a real unique sound, the Rolling Space Echo. Other digital delays are nice and uh, they all have their place, but sometimes a real charm about the sound of a Rolling Space Echo. It just has that, uh, it's got a real vibe all of its own. Great for Reagan, you can hear that as well. That's uh, I think that's on uh, setting three on the Space Echo, which gives a kind of, you know, triplet type effect. And that is your real classic dub effect as well. Still a lot of mixers and whatnot, you'll get that uh, kind of delay effect that people use at build-ups and that can all be traced all the way back to the Rolling Space Echo which was very popular with a lot of reggae dub producers in the mid 70s and it's one of the ones that like I say I use a lot as well. Another one of G-Man's top tips for you there, Rolling Space Echo. So, uh, and by the way that bit in the song there, it really plugs the gap. It's almost like a, I would say, um, a top line. Yeah, it's all it is, it's the loudest thing in the mix at that point. But delay is good if you've not got many words in a song or you've got a phrase that's quite basic. Delay is good to kind of plug the gaps. After there's a song by uh, Pink Floyd, "Us and Them," and it literally just says "us and them." You know, but what happens is they put a delay on us. Us, 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 us. us. Us and them, 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 and it plugs the gap when there's not as many lyrics. So that's another really good use for something like a kind of delay effect, like so. Anyway, so back to the matter in hand. Switch off my main track there now. All these things in orange here are my effects. I would say effects are the bells and whistles in a track. You can't have too many, too many of them in a dance track. I like to kind of go to town and it's all that kind of, you know, build up and kind of come down type effects as well. I'm just going to move things here. Like I say, I'm sitting in a cyclone because Glasgow is experiencing a heat wave like never before. Which is why I have one, two, three, four. I actually have four fans on me at the moment and I'm using on my microphone here a noise gate. I'll just show you this. I go into my sound card here. Okay, yep, my noise gate effect. Yep, every time I speak, the noise gate is opening and closing. That's the noise gate I've set on my mic. Listen to this without. <laughs> so the noise gate, yep, one, two. Every time I speak, the noise gate opens. You hear a bit of the fans in the background, but without that. There we go. And I'm just happy that my sound card actually has a noise gate on it. I run a recording studio. I've run a recording studio in a couple of different venues. The last place I worked in, I had to become an expert in using noise gates because there was a there was three death metal bands that had a room share next door to me. And they put a thumping 
bass drum through a PA system. So no, it wasn't just the volume of them. They were actually putting the drum kit through a massive PA, which had huge bass spins, and the whole wall was just rumbling the whole time. And every time I was trying to record the vocal, I'd be getting this kind of rumble in the background. But thankfully, by using a noise gate, I managed to omit most of those frequencies. But eventually, it just became unworkable. This room I'm in at the moment, it's all insulated. It's quite a good place as far as um, you know, acoustics go, which is something you should really take into account when you are producing music. Is the music that you're actually, or sorry, the room that you're producing in. Uh, if you're producing in a really kind of clattery room, something that's got a lot of hard surfaces, what you'll probably find is that um, you get a lot of kind of high-pitched zing on your sound. Just kind of, it's, it's quite difficult to mix in a room like that. So having a good environment, and in this room here is the top mezzanine floor, which is why it's so bloody roasting. But this is the top mezzanine floor, uh, oh, sorry, the top floor, and it's on the mezzanine floor of a building. So I'm in the third floor up here. Now this, quite a shallow roof, but I've got curtains all the way around there. And uh, the fact that it's got quite a kind of low roof actually helps you really kind of get a nice sound. I've been in rooms that are big and, you know, like I say, hard surfaces, not well insulated, and you can't really distinguish whether there's too much treble or it's just the sound of the room. I like to have a really dead sounding room, which is why this place works for us. But anyway, back to the matter at hand. All these effects we are talking about, what do I have here? Let me just go through them. The Vibra Slap. Why not have a Vibra Slap in a record? I thought to myself, on every beat you're getting this, or... If, should I say, yeah, every, uh, yeah, every, every four beats, not every eight beats, sorry, of course every eight beats, I'm getting a vibra slap, which is this. It's one of those kind of noises you'd expect to hear in one of those uh, talking books. Turn the page at this sound. I am drinking a shitload of fizzy juice at the moment. That's what hot weather does to me. Anyway, so, yeah, we have that vibra slap. On top of that, we also have a sub. Ooh. Yeah, that sub, I like to use it a lot. It adds a lot of drama to the sound. And that's just a simple kind of sine wave pitching itself down. Use it a lot. You've got to be careful, though, and it doesn't get in the way of the bass in the track because a lot of bass frequency off of that. And, a lot of, and bass frequency you don't always hear. Sometimes you look at your speakers and they're flapping away, and that's because it's like a kind of almost subsonic sound that, pardon me, is getting produced. We've got another sub drop in here, a short sub drop, I've noticed. Boom. A pre sub sub, if you will. It's a wee bit smaller. What do we have here? What other songs? What other sounds, should we say? Oh, the old record crackle. Love it. I quite like the crackle on vinyl. It's not something people ever really went looking for when they thought of, you know, vinyl. That record crackle. All your records ended up sounding like that anyway. I know mine did. Backward symbol. Always. Every track I do. Brings you in. Leads you in there. Okay. As well as that, that's on top of other effects we have here. I've got a backwards brass tab here. This brass. Yeah, that there, that is a backwards sample. That's just brass playing a note and uh, it's faded out, then they've reversed the sample. On top of that as well, air build. We've just got another kind of effect. This other kind of whooshing noises. I like to have a lot of kind of air type sounds in the background. So that's a composite sound. Back to, again, what I said earlier, layering all these sounds together. Other stuff as well. This is a sample I found. Hiss Riser, I like this one. Like that. Very dramatic. Taking any sound that has a kind of noise element to it, more than a tone element, and reversing it can create a real nice effect. And when I say a noise and tone, what I mean by that is a tone's a, a consistent sound. A tone gives it a kind of a, a frequency, a consistent frequency, where a noise, like a crash or something, uh, the waveform generally kind of dies off quick because there's not a regular oscillating tone to the sound. So this is effectively noise samples that have been reversed. And on, as well as that, we have a riser here. And have you noticed that I've put a big fade on that to start?
classic Ibiza stuff. No Ibiza! Yeah. So it helps leading into every eight bars, every section there. We've got all these sounds stacked up together. Let me play them all together. Very dramatic indeed. So then our sounds start to kick in at the end of that. Yeah. And that there is followed, I believe, by the synth line. Or just actually, just at the end of that, we get the synth line here. Yeah. Really takes us into the next section there. So yeah, effects, very, very important. If you're doing effects, yeah. I'm oh, sorry, if, you, if you're doing a dance track, then yeah, you, the effects are the bells and whistles you put on. First you get all your riffs sorted, you get uh, you get, get your hooks in there, but then the final thing I do, I mean, I often put effects in at start because I just like how they sound. They give a real vibe to the thing. Uh, and it's all part of the ebb and flow, the kind of build up, the kind of take down of the sound as well. When I'm talking about effects, there's one I've missed out there. This is a sample I made on my... On my old Juno 106 synthesizer, sadly departed due to me being a skint musician, but shit happens, I'd rather keep the lights on than just have that synth. But, this is what I made on that synth. Yeah. All these together really increase the drama of the song. So that is all those kind of build-up effects I use. There's that one else here that's always uses my songs. I kind of wish, I kind of wishy-washy background. Yeah. But turn that up. That is, it's almost like sticking your ear to a shell and hearing the seaside. Yeah. You'll notice what I've done here. I've Run that through an EQ, I've taken a lot of the bass out. If I put the bass back in, you'll hear why I took it out. Yeah, yeah. So that's quite a heavy kind of whoosh sound, but when we put the, what you call a high pass filter, it's just allowing the high to pass through there. Put that sound on now. It's been filtered. Take up further even, and that in the background with a lot of reverb. Now regarding reverbs in the song, I always have a kind of house reverb, a long reverb, a, a room reverb, and then I tap a lot of things into that sound. Most things, I, it gives a cohesive sound if you use your reverb, if you use a sense for the reverb as opposed to inserts. Now what I mean by sends and inserts, an insert for instance, a classic example is plugging a guitar in. If I plug a guitar in to a pedal and then into the amplifier, that's like an insert. I've inserted something into the chain, okay? And an insert is on the channel itself, okay? Where uh, a send is more like using an effects loop. You know, you get an effects loop that'll be separate from the input in the guitar amp and you can turn up as much effect you want or as little. But it's kind of similar to that because you're feeding with this it's effects send here. If I show you on the screen, look over here, you can see that you're actually feeding, yeah, da, 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 there we go, yeah, this here, bus one, you're, that, that's how much of this send, how much do I want to send into this effects unit here, which has, in this case, the Space, space Designer on Logic. Now, Space Designer is a good reverb, I like it, it's what you call a convolution reverb. These reverbs base their actual signal path on an actual sampled reverb. Someone will play a sound, you know, where they made this, they'll play a sound in a canyon, say, and with stick a speaker at one end and a mic at the other, and they'll measure that frequency or that, that waveform, and then they recreate it in these reverbs. Takes up a bit of space, a bit of processing power, but I think it's worth it. You know, the, uh, like I say, this, uh, it's a good go-to reverb for me using this one here. This, like I say, is Space Designer on Logic. Uh, and regarding other... Uh, Sequencers as well. I mean, Cubase is excellent. I've used that. I do use Ableton as well. Um, I'm not as hot in Pro Tools. Reason being is that they just have to buy so many other third-party plugins to run it. 
And my problem is that um, I'm not loaded. And I think you really need to be able to buy the amount of stuff to run Pro Tools successfully. So Logic's always been a good solution. But that's how I started using it. When I use it professionally now, I could probably justify going to something like Pro Tools. But that's not what it's about. It's not about having the latest sequencer. It's not about having the latest plugins. It's about having something that works and knowing how to use it. Too many people I know buy all the studio equipment at once. And they just like phone me up and ask me how to come around and show it, how, how I work it for them. And they... they to be honest, they never really learn. It just bamboozles them. Too much plugins, too much choice at any one time can really kind of fry your brain when it comes to music production. Just buy one plugin at a time. If you are to buy any third party plugins, learn it to death, then move on to the next one. Don't buy everything at once because you can't learn all this at once. Music production takes years to learn. Like I say, I've been doing this since I've been about 13, 14, you know, so we're talking for over 20 years realistically, for the time that I've spent just kind of reading books, and in this case, reading uh, or watching YouTube videos and stuff now as well. I more or less taught myself music production, but nowadays, I would have, if I'd been, uh, if, I, if I'd been, say, in my prime, if you like, now, then I would have been able to learn music production a lot quicker, because every single thing you get a problem with, go and type it into YouTube, and you'll get someone that'll know about it, someone that's fixed it, you'll get some forum online that'll be able to help you as well. If I, for instance, had a problem, say, you know, um, uh, um, say, glitch, uh, audio glitch from, you know, Logic 10, I would type that in Logic 10 audio glitch issue. And then on YouTube, there'll be someone doing a, a, a speech about it, someone telling you about it. And on that note, by the way, I am going to be uploading all of these uh, Hot Knives House production sessions onto YouTube. I promise you I am. But anyway, let's just talk over here. We're on in the chat. Whoop, SU10 sample guy. How you doing, my man? Thank you very much for leaving a comment. What are you saying to it? So I hate to say it because I know you don't want to update Logic, but Chronoverb is insanely good on the level of TC. Chronoverb, I'm just going to take a wee note of that at the moment. And I'll tell you a secret. Between me and you, SU10 sample guy, I mostly use Valhalla Vintage Verb. But I just don't have it loaded onto this version of Logic, which is one of my number one go-to plugins. Space Designer is good, but Chronoverb, I'll be checking that out on the level of TC. Nice one, yeah. And a lot of the third-party plugins I do use in Logic 9. I use a lot of the Wave stuff, um, a lot of that. I mean, that's it's coming down in price all the time as well, but that's some of my go-to plugins. Unfortunately on this, I've stripped them all out. I've really just put it down at its most basic so that it'd work in this version of Logic 10. Reason being is that in order for me to stream to OBS, I need to use the latest version of the Mac operating system that doesn't run Logic 9, which I've fiercely stuck by over the years, and I think Apple's finally forcing me onto Logic 10. So yeah, I'm gonna get a wee look at that. But anyone else want to say hi, please do. Right, what do we have here now? Next up, we've got all the vocals. Yes, indeed, Mr. T with his fine smooth, slightly gravelly voice, which just works a treat on everything, man. Absolutely brilliant. So this vocal line is actually pitched down. Here's the main Netflix. vocal. Oh. Here we go. Have a listen to this. Oh. Me and your girl, we watch Netflix. Me and your girl, we play Tetris. She's in my world, you can't check this. Now you can hear that's quite low quality. Me and your girl, we've had breakfast. That's quite a raspy kind of sound. Me and your girl, we watch Netflix. I've pitched that down, and in doing so, it's also kind of made the quality a wee bit lesser as well. But that's cool. I wanted to go for something a wee bit more grimy. Chrono oh, there we go, sample guy. Chrono Verb is a stock logic plugin. You, there we go. I need to update my version of Logic. <laughs> but thank you anyway, mate. Yeah, so I this sample, like I say, I've down-pitched it a bit. Now, that's created the effect of what you used to get when the sample... Uh, basically, when dance music was really in its infancy, we're using samplers, like Akai samplers and other ones. Didn't have much memory, and they also were a bit less uh, bit rate than we have now. You were using things that had, like, 12-bit sample rates, which created a kind of grimy sound, and that's what I wanted to recreate with this vocal, something a bit grimy. Now, also, that vocal's pitched down, but it's only pitched down about, I would say, 
I, 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 I tone the danger go. We I think I wrote the song. A tone higher, then pitched it down initially. We play Tetris. But underneath that, we've got the devil voice. She's in my world, you can't do this. Absolutely terrifying. Me and you go, we've had breakfast. Yeah. Breakfast. So what I have done there is I've really pitched down a vocal. I think I used Melodyne for that. Melodyne is one of the best, uh, I would say, studio plugins ever. If you don't have it and you're a vocalist or you work in a studio, then you must have it if you're working with vocals. It's the most transparent plugin you can use for fixing pitch. But what you can also do, as I've done here, is create that kind of devil voice type effect. I've pitched that way down, as well as uh, marrying that up with something about normal pitch. Check this. Me and your girl, we've had breakfast. So what else have we got here? We've got... Me and your girl, we watch Netflix. Me and your girl, we play Tetris. Atri Real attitude She's voice. Where'd you get this? Yep. Attitude vocal on that one there, yeah. So we've got the three vocals basically playing together. Creates a real big effect. Breakfast. All these other samples here. She's in my world, you can. Yeah. Other samples we have, other parts of the song. It's not a very vocal heavy song, so it's just wee interjections for T, but that's really what works. And then, like I say, it was a line in his, um, what do you call it, in, in, his, uh, in his little black book of songs. It was me and your girl. We have meals, mostly breakfast. And that was really where the kind of inspiration for the song happened straight away. When me and T get together, it's one of those rare things that you, you know, we always come out with songs and, or loads of bits of songs, which is fine because that musical scrapyard you collect of different, you know, bridges, choruses, etc., all ends up in songs somewhere along the line. But it's a real positive vibe in that. We kind of feed off each other. Oh, we're on the chat here. The real Melly, Fle Melly Fresh. I love, love, love Melodyne. Yeah, me too. But but we never use it. Okay. Shh, don't tell anybody. Okay. I read an article in a Facebook site called Unilad. And they're talking about it. It was like a shock expose. <gasps> this is how they make vocalists sound in tune. And everyone was shocked. Oh, no. Is this really what happens? Is this what happens? Are we all getting conned in the studio? Yes, for a long time it's been happening. Yeah, Melodyne. If you don't use Melodyne in your vocals, you're probably going to have a track that's going to be up against other people who have used Melodyne. And people, even if they can't put a finger on it, the pitch being better, they will know subconsciously something's better. Everyone, everyone's ears is naturally drawn to the human voice. So that needs to be perfect on a track. You can't get away with that. People will listen to the vocal, because it's right front and centre, the main part of the track. Melly Fresh, what he's saying to it is, in, in Logic, Chris Lodge, LG vocals, not a bad pinch. Yep, the CLA stuff on the, the Wave plugin, I do like the CLA stuff. One of the ones I really, really like for using, in particular for guitars and drums, is the Jai Jai P, the Jack Joseph Quig plugins range as well. I use them a lot, because uh, like I say, this is a, a function recording studio. Not, not my mum's house, honestly. But no, that's a function recording studio. I'm getting bands in here all the time. And the Jai Jai P plug-in collection really works well. If you can get something that just off straight off the bat, you can switch on and it sounds great. That's 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 great. Why not run with that? Too many people are uh, get a bit, you know, anal about having to do it all from the ground up, make up their own patches. Whatever works, whatever sounds good. That is, I mean, the only thing wrong in music is someone telling you something's wrong because you might think it's the most bizarre out there thing you've ever done ever heard but you probably find somewhere that quite enjoys that sort of thing you know one man's pleasure another man's poison so anyway yeah on the vocals here what other vocals have we got is she really a girl though is she a girl well is she eh, is she really a girl though is she a girl oh oh no no yeah, definitely not your girl if you've been um, having Netflix and breakfast with someone else yet. But that's another story. And one of one of one of questionable morals as well, I <laughs> Desire. It's really something that never goes out of fashion. Which is why I often return to that concept when we're writing music as well. Desire never goes out of fashion. Yeah. If you write songs about something really specific, sometimes it can uh, I think it can you can exclude people. You keep something general 
and your lyrics are easily relatable. People can take what they want from that. I've had written songs that have been about nothing really to do with what people have thought it was about, but they've taken that and they've had that meaning from it and they thought, oh, that's great. You know, if that works for them, then great. Often it's a good idea not to tell people what you've written songs about because they might have thought it was about something completely different. Oh, that's a beautiful love song. And someone actually wrote it about their football team winning a football game, you know. Keep it general and also keep these things to yourself. So, what other vocals do we have here? Go, go, she a girl. Eh, eh, eh. Yep. Same vocals. Basically, we've got a kind of fundamental part there and we've also got T doing harmonies as well. I like to keep this kind of I call it electro soul, you know, this kind of soulful vibe and lots of harmonies, that kind of gospel -y type effect, that really takes us there, that brings the soul, T is the soul man, and he brings the soul to our records. Now, going over here as well, in the 12-inch mix that I played you earlier, I'm also, I believe we got a rap thing. Me and Jacoby, what? We have a rap, if you can find it. Is she really? Not that bit. Third time lucky. Is she really? No. Where is a rap? Rap, rap, rap. Oh, there we go. I found it now. Yes. Go deep and I'm gonna go in. New whip and so I'm going for a spin. Hit that's the fundamental. Got a double track. Go deep and I'm gonna go in. New whip and I'm going for a spin. Hit tease and I'm going for a trim. Got the ball and I'm going for the win. Yeah. That's got the, the main uh, rap in there. Okay. Go deep and I'm gonna go in. We've got a double track on it. It's important if you're doing a double track, get a good tight double track, but it can't be perfect. See if you actually had a perfect double track, it would phase and then it doesn't really sound very nice. And I often think if you're double tracking one person, doing two vocals can sound still at one vocal. I've, you know, supposedly double tracked and I've done four tracks of someone singing the same thing because it sounds a bit bigger. If two people are singing together, they will naturally have a different rhythm to their voice, different accents, different, you know, just, just a different way of phrasing things. And that will always create a, a slightly bigger sound as a result. You get a bit of a thinner sound if someone's singing top of themselves. Exactly. So this is a, it's just a wee tiny bit out from each other. New whip and I'm going for a spin. Hit tease and I'm going for a trim. Got the ball and I'm going for the win. Yeah. Go deep and I'm going to go in. New whip and I'm going for a spin. Yeah. And also what I've got there is a slight kind of doubling effect. This is an R waves effect I use called the waves doubler. That gives a kind of a split. No whip and I'm going for a spin. It sits. almost makes the vocal sit a bit here. Yeah. So the other vocal sitting slap by in the middle and the double track has been split into two and it's sitting either side. You can also create this effect in Logic. There's an effect called sample delay, which is really good. It just does exactly that. It just takes either side sample, slows it down a little bit. Here we go. Can see if I can make this any bigger. Link left and right, okay, and move not. If I put, aye. Season, I'm going for a trim. So without. Got the ball and I'm going for the win. And with. Go deep and I'm going to go in. New whip and I'm going for a spin. Hit tease so and without, I'm going for a trim. Got the ball and I'm going for. I don't know if you can really hear that there, but what that does is it just splits the vocal. It makes it sit either side. So the lead vocal sits slap bang in the middle and this kind of double track sits either side. That creates the effect of a. You know, almost like three of T singing, but really, we were only hearing two of them. So there we go. Hit T's and I'm going for a trim. Got the ball and I'm going for the win. Go deep and I'm going to go in. Also, <laughs> that's like one of those documentary type voices where they pitch someone's voice down because, you know, their camera, their face has all been covered up or something like that, you know. All blacked out, yeah. That's the sound. No weapon, I'm going for a spin. But that mixed in with other vocals. Got the ball and I'm going for the win. Is she really up? Yeah, and we're back into the bridge there. Yeah, that all glued together gives a really big sound, and that is what we are after. Now, what other tracks have we got here? Let me just get a wee listen. Go, eh, eh, eh. Is she really up? Go, though, is she up? Go. Oh. Yep. A lot of harmonies here. We've got oh, no, no. The main vocal. Is she really up? Double track, lower track, middle hot harmony. Is she really up? The top harmony. Is she up? Oh, oh, no, no. Yeah, so quite a number of vocals there. Right, anyway, on the chat here, what's happening, guys? Say yo. Let me know what is happening. Because, like I say, we have been looking at the track Breakfast. 
I would say I just like in a, a good time house track. One I'm looking forward to releasing, like I say, this year with Play Records. And how are you doing, guys? Yo, yo, yo. Everyone's saying yo. Anyone else want to say yo? Feel free to do so. But yeah, right then. That pretty much covers the whole track, Breakfast. Just one last time, I'm going to give you a wee blast on this track before we can find something to read. So. This, like I say, is the track we've been looking at. This is Breakfast, and of course we have just premiered this. Just debuted this on Twitch tonight for all you people. So thank you very much for tuning in. Have a wee listen to this one last time. <laughs> So, thank you very much for tuning in to Hot Knife's house. I've just been looking over there to see who we are is going to Is she really a girl though? Is she a girl? Well, is eh, she? Eh, eh, eh. Is she? Is she really? I doubt it. But anyway, yeah. We are going to raid Travis Murray. Someone there is doing a wee bit of uh, music production as well. So, pretty much in the same vibe. Thank you very much for tuning in, guys. Now, I'm going to be here every single Friday. But next week, I'm going to be doing a, 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 a pre-recorded show. I'm actually out gigging because I have to make money so I can do these shows for all you wonderful people. Thank you very much for tuning in on the chat here as well. Here we go. Oops. Thank you, guys. And like I say, we are going to now raid Travis Money. I believe that is us. Here we go. Thanks very much for tuning in, guys. Cheers now. <laughs> <laughs> 